like someone feels lonely, they probably also don't feel at home or comfortable with the general nine to five living anyway. Which I think resonating is a very same on the street. I think one collective income of people is most of the people who've written nine to five. Hello and welcome to Promote the Hell Out of It. My name is Ms. Trujillo and on the show I chat to people worth promoting about subjects worth promoting. Generally about subjects I know very little about and want to know more about. Subjects I think all of us would probably do well if we knew more about. And today's episode is one where I went into it knowing very little and having a lot of preconceptions, a lot of which turned out to be wrong, some of which were right. I chat to my good friend, Richard Heaven. I know Richard through the punk rock scene. He's an incredibly talented writer and artist as well as a punk rock aficionado, but that is not what we're talking about in today's episode because recently he started an officer cadet apprenticeship uh, in nautical science working with the Merchant Navy, which means he spends a lot of months on end out at sea. Now, everything I knew about the Merchant Navy was based on misconceptions from watching films and TV, I associated it directly with the army and everything I know about spending time out at sea is based on rumours my family told me about my grandfather who was a fisherman and spent months on end out at sea. So, I was excited to hear what Richard had to say, I was excited to know what life is like in the Merchant Navy and I hope you enjoy this conversation. So yeah, so Richard... (laughs) You've told me that you did five months out at sea this time. Uh, five and a half, yeah. Five and a half. Yes, that was Was that delayed because of the whole Brexit situation? Well, I kind of came out halfway through it. With, essentially, a company had turned around to the four ships and said, you've got to be in the UK by this date and easily obtainable. Because who knows, you might be brought in to do a ferry service or something. It's a very unsure time. Unfortunately, we got in about three weeks before, so we end up just sitting at anchor off the Isle of Wight for about four weeks straight. <laughs> Whilst every day we come up, have you heard from the office? No. Have you heard from the office? No. That's ridiculous. It was tense. <laughs> and I guess that's the kind of thing that that people don't realise is going on behind the scenes when politics are involved. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like any job in any life. What happens in the country you're involved with affects everything. Not in not in terms of not being able to go home for an extra month normally. It's not like you're yeah. stuck at the train station for an extra month going, can't get home because Brexit, we don't know what's going on. <laughs> oh no, hang on. People could leave the ship and go back to the UK. It's just, I'm still on my time working. Fair enough. So how would you do that in that in that situation? How would you leave the ship? Um, okay, on the side of the ship, we can either get off from the poop deck or on a lot of ships like us, we have this door three or four metres and have it above the water line. And you lift it up, you drop a ladder down, and you can get onto small sips and bards. That's cool. On the side, which is, we go to a place called Ascension. It's 1,500 miles off of Africa, and it hasn't got a port big enough to take any moderate size of sip. So we just have to do that. We get a local boat come out, go down to this little barge you put next to it, climb on, and go back to the island. That's mm-hmm. ridiculous. Were there people that did that at that time that went back home, or were most people in your situation where they were just kind of like, get on with it? Um... To be honest, it still counts as time for your job, so we were just cracking on and getting on with it. Yeah. Yeah. Were there conversations about what was coming up? Yeah, I mean, you hear rumours. You We call it galley radio because <laughs> everything goes through the galley. But you hear rumours very often they weren't true. So before then, this is the, the longest time you'd done out at sea, right? Yes, before this I'd done one trip for four months and one trip for four and a half. Was it harder? Did you find it harder to do a longer time? Um... No, I think when you hit about the two month part, or two months by the end of the first month, you mentally you think this is my island, this is the town I live in, this is my life now, to use a common meme. But yeah, yeah you just get used to it. Like you do your watches, you know what needs to be done, you go to a bar in the evenings. That's cool. And and you get time on land? If we can. Nowadays, unlike say forty, fifty years ago, we expect everything so much quicker. So whereas you might have said, okay, we're loading things by hand, we can get 10 containers on today, you're going to be in port for three weeks. It'll be like, even on a normal, not particularly energetic day, we can easily do 10, 12 containers in an hour. Wow. But yeah, I mean, we ended up in Barbados for five days. That was fun. But that definitely was not the normal. Mm. You treat it as a nice day out. You treat it like a weekend, like, you know, you finish your work at midday, they said, yeah, knock off, we're done now. 
you just go off and you appreciate the fact it's time off. You're having a good day. You never think, oh, I'm not going back to the sip. Because yeah. you're not. It's like you might have a quiet hour working in a bar and you have a drink with your workmates. And obviously you're, you're still on your apprenticeship yes. at the moment. How much of your time on ship is work versus learning? The way it's laid out is you essentially do a phase at college, which is typical of a university setup, a phase at sea, phase at college, phase at sea. And what I'm going into next month is my final phase at college, which we do our final short courses like advanced firefighting and like, and we do a lot of revision for our final exams called the Orvals. So often when you're at sea, in theory, you'll be applying what you learned at college in a real world situation. But as we probably all know, as good as it is having theory, you can't be just getting hands on and doing it. That's yeah. the best way to learn. Do you get in situations where although you've had the theory, you get stuck? Is there someone that, is there always someone on hand to help? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, as a cadet legally, we can't take control of the SIP because cool. we haven't qualified. We haven't yeah. hit that rank. But yeah, there's always going to be someone supervising you. Have and you yeah. had anything massively go wrong yet where you're like, shit, I don't know what <laughs> yeah. I'm about to do? Um, yeah. I mean, Dover Calais is one of the busiest straits in the world. And there's been times that I've been not taking the watch, but under supervision, being like, okay, what are you doing in this situation? Oh, I'm going to do this, and thinking out of itself. But that gets inherently busy. And a few times I've been like, oh, there's so much happening here, I'm a little overwhelmed. What do we do? And it's, it's good when you've got the other person on hand, because they'll be like, okay, we're going to look at this, this, and this. They're doing that. That's the immediate threat. We're going to move like this. That's fair enough. What? How would you describe that situation? Because from from where I am, the mm-hmm. times I've been on on a ship, you're like, but there's nothing around me for fucking miles. <laughs> like it doesn't like it doesn't seem difficult. Like cooking a burger doesn't seem difficult, and then and then until yeah. you go to do it and you do it wrong and you burn it. <laughs> I mean, no, you hit a point there. If you're deep sea, like we do a lot of transatlantic ones, yeah, for eight days when you're in bare middle of the ocean, you might see another sip and that'd be 30 miles away. In which case, you don't do anything. It's not going to hit you. It's not going to cut you up. It's not going to cause any trouble. It's just like seeing someone on the side of a field and going, hey, yeah. Uh, Dover to Calais. Yeah, Dover to Calais. The vast majority of the ocean and waterways are laid out in charts which can be read almost like a road directions map. And we have these things called traffic separation schemes, cool. which is essentially dual carriageway around tricky parts for SIPs. And there's a whole yeah. set of rules and laws what goes on them, which when someone disobeys it and the Coast Guard's getting touched with them can be the funniest listening. <laughs> and that's how you stop problems. They all know not to manoeuvre in a certain way, not to take certain liberties. You're, you're always going to be in a situation where you think, oh, something's developing, it's in my right to try and affect this even if it's doing five sort blasts and saying what the hell's going on let us know your intentions so we can move okay this is interesting and it's not it's not what i had in mind to talk about but i'm, I'm fascinated <laughs> by it because i think i like to think that i research stuff that i <laughs> generally i have a conversation with someone and something like this will come up and i'm like i don't know jack shit about this so i'll go and research it so if i haven't read anything about this then i'm guessing a lot of people haven't um can you overtake when yeah. you're... Yeah? So yeah. is there, like, basic, like, rules so you overtake to one... Like, is it kind of similar to, like, when you're driving on a motorway? It is. Essentially, obviously, situations develop where laws start to contradict each other and you might have to figure it out. But on the most basic situation, if you're coming up to a SIP for more than two points of bath to being, you are the overtaking vessel. Now, it's your responsibility, to, as long as it's safe to do so, to stay out of the vessel which you're overtaking until you're clear and past... And that sounds like a basic rule, but you've got to look at your situation and say, how do I define what's safe? How do I define clear and path? Because like I was saying about traffic separation schemes, you have not got a lot of space to manoeuvre, so that could be a lot closer than you want to do deep sea. Deep sea, you might wait to a mile and a half, um, mile and a half two miles away. That's ridiculous. You don't have that space at all in a TSS. <laughs> but yeah, and the other vessel would be the stand-on vessel, which means they maintain their speed and course. And it's your responsibility as the overtaken vessel to stay out their way. That's cool. Yeah, the basic version of it. What is a BAFTA beam? It okay, like so like Star Wars. <laughs> if you look, you've got like three sixties in front of you, and you've got like zero, ninety, one eighty, two seventy. A beam is direct white angles to a SIP, so that's ninety and one eighty with uh, forward end beam zero. And we'd use a system called point, so there's eight points in each quarter, so it's eleven point two five degrees each. Cool. And so two points of BAFTA beam would be two points behind for white angle. 
Okay. Of the beer. Yeah. And it all ties into like legally what lights you have to have on a sip and what you can see from what distances and because each one has an arc of visibility. So if you can't see one, you know roughly what area you are in relation to the other sip. One of the things we were talking about before doing the podcast mm -hmm. is the misconception of what the Merchant Navy is. And specifically, I personally think that the connotation that comes just with the word Navy, Yeah. I instantly associate it with politics. I instantly associate it with the government. Mm hmm with what Britain did, what Spain <laughs> did, both our countries yeah. went and, and basically slaughtered a load of people. Um, with that in mind, coming from someone that I've known in the punk scene for such a long time, <laughs> the instant reaction is to go, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> um, so, I know that's not the case. Yeah. Can you maybe explain a bit what the difference is between the Merchant Navy to what we're thinking or what I'm thinking when I think of the Navy? Oh, I completely understand your assumptions because I think I probably made them myself for some time. Do you remember when you were doing London so there was Peter Young? He used to run All at Sea Records. Yeah, I do, yeah. That's how I got into it. We were just hanging out one day in London. He was getting drunk. I was during my Questionable Straight Edge phase. <laughs> and... I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, he was telling me about it. I thought, oh, I think really, really cool. And eventually I went through loads of jobs I hated and thought, oh, I'm going to have to look into this properly. And I did. I thought I was too old to do it, but I wasn't. So I did the interview, went through the whole thing and just life moved on that way. But yeah, I totally get what you mean. The thing, what you need to do is disconnect the word Navy from automatically assuming fighting force. It's not the military. Navy is simply you're working at sea. So Merchant Navy, like the name suggests, you're basically carrying cargo from one place to another in one form or another. Even if they're cargo, I mean cruise ships, meaning other people. I mean, they're horrible sights to see, but you do see animal ships, like produce ships. So ships. If you, you look, go down the motorway and you see these vehicles full of sea, full of lambs, that but on an industrial ship scale. They are incredibly ugly and weird ships to see. But yeah, I mean, it's overly simplifying it and probably makes more different connotations, but I've always described it as river lorry drivers of the ocean. That's fair enough. <laughs> and I liked something that we you mentioned when we were talking before was that obviously, and, and I think it's important to touch on because I don't like to stray away from, from things that maybe people don't like hearing initially. Mm -hmm. So that can include having clients that are for the military, for example, at times. Yeah, of course. You can get on a bus with a sergeant. Yeah, and I think that's important because, because I don't like pretending that things aren't the way they are. Yeah. Um, and someone could easily listen to this conversation and then be like, look it up online and be like, oh yeah, but you worked on this. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, that's not what we're saying. We're saying it's not, you're not working for the military yeah. in this situation. It's it's one of these kind of scale where it does come with a lot of connotations, but it's like also you can walk into Sainsbury's and buy a bottle of beer. A squaddy could have walked in and bought a bottle of beer. Now are you going to boycott Sainsbury's because they serve a squaddy? No, you're not. of course not. That's a larger conversation. But it doesn't start with the person who's working on a ship. Exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, that's a very good point. Like, there's the idea in popular media, you, someone goes to the captain, and the captain is a be-all and a sail. Yeah. And there is truth in that. In terms of matters of a ship, maintaining the safety of the crew, passengers, the ship itself, and the cargo, in a situation, yes, the captain's word is that. But the captain does also, in the grand scheme of things, have to answer to the head office, who are doing all the bookings, managing the business side of it. Yeah, what, I think that, that everything people know about what it could possibly be like to mm -hmm. live on a ship yeah. is based on films, yeah. TV series, and what they've heard people say. And I said to you before we started recording, my granddad was a fisherman. Yes. So everything I know is from what my dad said. Yeah. He drank a lot. He died <laughs> because he was an alcoholic. He was out at sea nine months. It was a bunch of lads trying to get through a fishing yeah that's not what it's like no i mean <laughs> you do have tough times and i think maybe the core of that the loneliness need for a community and just human interaction yeah whether you work on a cruise ship but many people are the loneliest ships of all or you work on a fish ship as i don't know how big your family's fish ship was but i'm guessing not massive no. yeah and that's gonna be in real tight quarters so it's probably even worse for them yeah but yeah um it's a very strange experience being at sea and loneliness does play a big part of it, I think. Do you think loneliness 
plays a part of it from the start, from the choice of being willing to do that, though? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think it does, but not as the main cause. I think it may play into other things. Like, if someone feels lonely, they probably also don't feel at home or comfortable with the general 9-to-5 living anyway. But I think Merton Navy is a varied to anyone you meet in the street, but I think one collective thing that comes with people is most of them are people who wouldn't do 9-to-5. They just don't feel in touch with that side of modern life. It's interesting because it's very easy to think that a person who would decide to, to be in a situation where they're lonely for an extended period mm -hmm. of time is someone who feels comfortable being lonely. Um, but I feel like it's the opposite. Someone who feels comfortable all the time mm -hmm. doesn't suddenly want to feel uncomfortable for an extended period of time. Someone who's used to feeling like they can be on their own mm -hmm. is more likely to be willing to be on their own for five and a half yeah. months. No, I think you hit the nail absolutely white right on the head. That's a good way of putting it. Maybe it's a big social element to be honest with but I think as a whole, you're team members, but you're also quite happy in your own company. And I think that's something that comes from being in that situation, of being alone for so long. And I think about it earlier, like, you see a lot of things like people might go on a free trip to India to find themselves. And it looks like a brilliant time, great holiday and the like. But they always seem to come back and say, I, 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 it was great, I learned a few things, but I don't feel like I found myself. Like, I expect some great revelation. But also, it's kind of like, when you go away to sea, you do have to deal with, you could be on a watch silent, because no one's talking for four hours, staring into the dark. You might be incredibly lonely, you might be missing home for weeks at a time. And it's that kind of long period of having to deal with what's in your head, your thought processes, processing that and the reason behind them. I think you get a lot more comfortable if you are, because you're forced to confront that, because it isn't constant stimuli on SIP. Okay. If that makes sense. Absolutely. And this is the reason, really... I wanted to have this conversation. For me, the idea of being on a ship on my own for five and a half months, mm -hmm. and, and I'm taking completely aside the working element of yeah. it, just the social element of it, is both the, the scariest thing, but also something that I would love to do. Yeah. And it's that conflicting emotion of, of it being something that isn't nice, but at the same time is nice. Like solid, tr like being on your own is amazing, mm -hmm. but when you don't want to be on your yeah. own, suddenly <laughs> it's the worst feeling ever. Yeah, and to be fair, I think maybe I probably play it a bit harshly. Like on our sips, we do have a bar, but you got to remember, for a two hundred meter sip, we only have twenty members of crew. Yeah, and they're split between officers, which is subsequent between deck officers and engineers, and then you got A B S and motormen. Which are uh, the muscle of a sip, essentially. Like, they're the ones that are out every day getting the job done, helping with maintenance, whilst engineers do all the mechanical and engineering stuff. And us deckies, we handle sip navigation, what's keeping, passage planning, cargo loading, um, weather monitoring, communications, everything you'd probably expect with like a top hub. So, with everything you've taken into account, what's this? Split ratio between men, women? Honestly, terrible. I think women in the industry, talking about deck officers and engineers, so we ignore stuff like the crew sip, which will have maybe a lot of female dancers or barmaids and that kind of thing. On the pure sailor side of it, it's only about 3.5% women in the industry, which is something they've been trying to combat. And it's that's been so recent, I couldn't really give you any figures no, on that, how that's changed. Yeah. But one positive thing I did see, like not this year, but the year before, I was working at the college. It's like an induction day, just chatting to people as they come through the doors, answering questions. I saw a lot more female engineers coming in, which is absolutely fantastic. Like That's I said, it was probably two thirds men and a third female. It's compared to three and a half percent is a massive jump. So I think progress is being made, but is it'd that be nice to speed it up. <laughs> is that represented in the way people act on ship? Is it a very laddie culture? It can be, but how long's a piece of string? It depends who's sitting yeah, yeah. in a room at any one time. Is there dating on a ship? I think if you're on cruise ships, there's a big culture of dating between officers and non-officer staff, so like dancers and that kind of thing. And a part of that is that it does come down to accommodation situation. Officers get nice cabins, the other staff probably don't. Okay. But 
You shouldn't be dating up the rank, like say if you're a third officer, you probably shouldn't be dating the captain. But if you have passengers on board or someone in a different area or guests, I don't think there's anything strongly against it. But again, it could come down to company. Some companies might absolutely hate it. The reason I mention this isn't to get anyone into <laughs> trouble or anything like that. Hey, it's I've got more, a clean slate, mate. <laughs> it's more because I'm interested in, in the myths that surround being on a boat. Yeah. In, in the concept of, of how much even being five and a half months at sea yeah. can affect someone in terms of sex. Is that something that affects people whilst they're out at sea? Yeah, of course. People get lonely and you can definitely get people who first trip clubs to other forms of night out. It's nowhere near as much as a stereotype makes out, but yeah. you go to different parts of the world and different services are on offer. Yeah. Whether someone takes it up depends on the person. I think there's a lot more of that in the olden days, which ties into how commerce has changed over the years. Now we can be expected to get to America and be out of the port within eight hours dropping our stuff off. Where in the past you might get ten trail containers done an entire day of a manpower instead of in an hour, so you know you'd have a week there. And I know some people who have spent we're talking about real older generation here who would have spent three, four weeks in the port and they would have actual girlfriends and relationships there. But nowadays, in today's culture, no. Okay, and with this in mind, something that is, I think, pivotal to moving ahead as a society mm-hmm. is the view of masculinity and of being able to break down barriers of what's discussed and what isn't discussed, of being able to have honest conversations with each other. Is there ever a conversation, or have you ever seen a conversation about, for example, the sex industry and how that is viewed? Is like Are these conversations had, or is it because of being male-dominated, just get well, on with it? They are had. They are had, definitely. Um, the nice thing about being on watch in the evening, because a few of you up there, you do get a lot of conversation going. And I'd like to say, as an industry, for me, you know, it's, it's not a surprise it's a very traditional industry in many ways. I think it's slowly, slowly getting less old fashioned in that sense it's getting a little more open minded but that's only coming in with the younger generations coming in so it's something that's taking quite a lot of time but in talk of what you talk about say masculinity and taboo subjects I think it's probably more open than you'd imagine like even if you know a lot of the older might people like see mental health as a buzzword being used by newspapers there is still that kind of actually you're going for a rough time you can come and have a talk to me that's a bit more understanding in there and I no, I don't I don't say it I, I'm telling you what I know the stereotypes are mm-hmm. and what I know I'm affected by because of those stereotypes. How I know I reacted when you told me what your job role was yeah. initially. But I'm not saying it as uh, as a negative because I'm honestly... The, the best thing for society is for these things to develop and oh, for, yeah, it, definitely. for it to be diverse and, and for, for people to be able to talk about these subjects and for it to get better. Otherwise, yeah. you can't trade. If there's no merch and navy, they yeah. want three bucks. <laughs> like. I mean, many will line enough, like 90% of anything that comes into a country or around the world, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll be amazed on things you sip, carry. <laughs> it goes back to something I was asking you before, mm-hmm. and we've touched on it when I mentioned about the Brexit situation. Yeah. But we were talking about about trade deals mm-hmm. and about how much it's affected. Like, yeah. so you're not tied down to working for the British Navy in any way once you get your like once you finish your training. Yeah, me as an individual, no. Yeah, I'm not tied in. So that means that if if the political situation changes worldwide, mm-hmm. you can change company yeah. to best suit. Oh, yeah. The trade deals that are available. Yeah, my qualification or what we call them in the industry is tickets. My ticket is recognised around the world. It's an international qualification because we have a whole legal area around the world. It's an agreement which combines laws. It means there's certain laws which transcend most borders. There's some I haven't signed up to, but the vast majority of the world has. So no, if I wanted to go work for an Indian registered company over in India, yeah, that would be a problem. You mentioned that when you get out at sea, mm-hmm. is it what, did you say 30 miles? Uh, 24 miles. 24 miles. It becomes maritime law. Yeah. There's a couple of areas in between it where it changes what kind, but like 24 is for dead cut off. Okay. Into deep sea. What does maritime law include, roughly? I'm not expecting her. <laughs> yeah, um, I think the easiest way to describe maritime law and what it handles is living conditions for crew, handling of cargo, which means start talking about 
gases, liquids, ammunitions, commercial goods, people in terms of customers is a very broad subject. A big one in the last 50 years or so has been environmental factors. So what type of oil you can burn where, how you dispose of your waste, how you generate energy. It's all stuff that's been constantly improved on. It's a bit of a hot topic right now. And, put simply, walls of a road. You need how to react in another way if you see another sip. And the walls of the road are there, so you maintain safety at all times. And if everyone on the sea is hot with it, it's like driving a car. You know what a car in front of you should do so you can preempt their actions instead of having to try and get in contact. Do you often come across people who don't know what they're doing? Yeah. <laughs> yes, we do. Do you? How do you deal with, with that situation? I'll, I know it's not you personally. Yeah, yeah. Um, depends on the situation. Like, when we go through the Dover Calais Straits, you occasionally come across SIPs who don't understand how to work in traffic separator scheme and just cut across it inappropriately or try and come down the opposite way, which is the equivalent of driving a car down a one-way street. <laughs> but there's like six aisles and these cars aren't overly maneuverable. Oh. But yeah, then you'll have people with Coast Guards and other industries keeping an eye on them and they can contact them and say, OK, yep, yeah, why are you doing this? Well, you have breached wall 5, 10, 2 and 16 of coal regs, which is wall of roads. And they will get fined for it or get brought up with whatever flag state they're, if I remember this correctly, whatever flag state they're signed up to, and they will be like, okay, well, here's a punishment. This is so many ticks. And So if we're moving forward from the, mm-hmm. the sort of political situation yeah. and that how that affects it, and we're thinking of what you've learned from being in the situation of Brexit delaying your, yeah. your stay out at sea, <laughs> Of, of being, already being lonely, like like you said, of, mm-hmm. of having to deal with, with that situation. Yeah. What would you say is, is the main thing you've learned from your experience? Um, well, firstly, just take it on a side load. Uh, when we had to wait around for Brexit, it wasn't so bad because we have in range of UK signals, so actually we had the best communication we've had in a long, long time. Oh, excellent. We can make phone calls and use the internet and, oh, it got dull, don't get me wrong, but... In terms of home comfort like that, it wasn't bad. But in terms of what you learn with loneliness being on your own, I think you learn how to be quiet with yourself and just learn how to relax. I think you learn what stresses you out more. And I think, obviously, you put someone in a room for 24 hours, they're going to think about the past. You realise things you thought, oh, I was a dick then. I don't want to be a dick like that. And you kind of take it into your life afterwards, thinking, OK, when I get back, I'm going to try and do this and chill out a bit more or act more proactively. So do you, would you say that that length of time that you're back, you keep those skills you've learned, that it stays with you? It takes a day to get into your job when you get there. If you haven't tied knots like regularly for three months, it might take a day just to get your hands into it. But no, I think it comes back to you very quickly, even as someone that's still training, when I come back from having like a year at college. I slipped into it very quickly. And what about vice versa? When you're back here, <laughs> do you keep the good habits that you've learned from being on your own? Yeah, I like to think so, yeah. Because I think if, you've, if it's been a situation where you think about it that much, it's something that deep down you're not actually happy about yourself either, which is quite important. That's, it's interesting because, you know, yeah. when we're educated at school, these things don't really get talked about. God, no. They don't, they don't get mentioned. We don't know what the hell the difference between the Navy and the Merchant Navy is. That's mm-hmm. why I've got preconceptions about what of it course. is. So opening up the conversation of what could possibly be our options or our kids' options, mm-hmm. is important. What would your sell be on what you're studying? If, if you had to say to someone, look, it's good because of this, or yep. only do it if you're this kind of person. And I'm saying this as someone's trained to be a deck officer. I couldn't speak exactly the same for the engineers because they've got their own skill set, their own interests, and a bit of a different culture of being an engineer. Personally, get involved if you want to travel. Like, it's not a lie. You do see the world. Get involved... If you're not happy with the nine to five and you find two days a week aren't cutting it for downtime. But also be involved if you're willing to learn constantly. You can't rest on your laurels. There's always so much changing in terms of laws, your own study, wanting to set up, uh, go up ranks in the company. It's a tough one. Like there's a definite academic side nowadays. And I think that's part of the movement between being an apprenticeship kind of thing and being more of a educational university course. And now I think it's sitting in a weird place between the two at the moment. But it has pros and cons. But yeah, I think you can be good at the physical side, but you need to be able to knuckle down and do the academic side as well. And as a cell, 
we need to talk about mm -hmm. the money and what you were mentioning about the time off. Um, you do get paid in your training because you're treated as an employee, which is good. And it's your me. company will pay for all your academic fees as well. So unlike university, you leave out of debt. But don't get me wrong, we're not a mega money, but That's still we get by. leaving in debt. Yeah, exactly. Um, in terms of when you're qualified, the money's good. And if you go outside the country for over 183 days, it's tax free. So if you think what you might lose on a 35 grand a year job, that's quite a chunk back, which is nice. So no, money is good. I think people go into it, go into it with the idea you're going to work hard for a few years and then set yourself out, get a mortgage, get these nice things you might not have had previously in life. But that's it comes with a trade-off. You're working six months a year. And you mentioned that when, when you initially had the conversation about the job with your friend, mm -hmm. you thought you were probably too old to apply for yes. it. Yes. What's the cut-off? There isn't one really. Like when I had that conversation, I was probably 21, 22, I reckon. I looked into it at 25 and I kind of joined at 26. In my class when I started, there was someone that was 34. And there's people who come out of college only 17 at the time. I think they like maturity, to be honest. Like I understand, even for a straight edge, when I became 17, 18, I definitely had a party animal side. And I think <laughs> it's nice to know if you're going to bed, you'll be happy, but probably calm down a little bit. <laughs> One thing I wanted to touch on, just briefly, mm -hmm. is roughly what your routine is when you're on the ship. Okay. Because we've talked about the loneliness, Yeah. but what does your day look like? Um, okay, as an officer of a watch, you are... Some companies do six hour watches, most do four now. Depending on your rank, you're required to do two watches a day. So third mate, which is the rank I'll be going into, you do... Let's start from midnight. You do... You have midnight to eight is your own time. 8 to 12 you're on watch up on the bridge so you'll be keeping an eye out for other sips responding to communication requests monitoring the weather preparing to go into port within the next few days anything that comes up you are the brain of the hub of the ship at that point you're the nerve centre after that I'll probably have lunch in about half 12 1 we'll go out on deck because as a third mate your main job is maintaining the safety of a sip so you're going over your life boys your life jackets your <laughs> life rafts make sure everything works your fly fighting equipment do that for a couple of hours to half two, three o'clock, then you'll be off again, you've got your time off, um, go back and watch eight o'clock in the evening to midnight, okay. and the day continues, and what you do in your off time is up to you, like some people go in the bar, some people video game, it's tough as an officer to drink in the bar, because you don't want to be under the effects of alcohol when you're running a ship, essentially, one, it's illegal, and B, it's incredibly bad judgment. Yeah, of course. If you're an engineer and you're not on duty, you finish work at five and you're not back down to eight the next day, so you can afford to have a more social life. And I think that's why deck officer there is more of an issue of loneliness, because you're so fragmented compared to everyone just working normal days. That's, that's difficult. That's difficult. Does that affect the relationship between the different job roles then as well? Not really. Only as much as the person wants to do it. Some people, there's the old saying of oil and water, that engineers and officers don't get on. Luckily, from my experiences, hasn't really been the case. Most people I met have been lovely. But if someone makes, wants to make an issue of it, they'll make an issue of it. Yeah. And you mentioned that people, uh, some people play video games. Yeah. What, do people take consoles with them? Is oh, there yeah. a TV in your room? What's the situation? Most of our ships have TVs, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I'm a big 3DS fan, so I take that. Um, we have a couple in the bar, which is good for a bit of social gaming now and then. I just bought a Switch mainly because it's the most sensible console. For my lifestyle, and I do love, and I do love Pokemon games. So yeah, <laughs> are you playing Zelda? No, I'm borrowing it off my friend, but I'm just working through Pokemon Let's Go, Monster Hunter Ultimate, and this brilliant indie oh, game yeah. called Night in the Woods. Nice. At the nice. moment, it seems weird to me to think of the concept of having a room on a ship. I was homeless for a while. Yeah. So there was a few periods during that time where a friend would be like, "Ah." Oh, We've had a room become empty in our student house mm -hmm. and someone's not moving until next month. Do you want it? Yeah. And they'd be like, hell yeah, I get a bed. It's a woof. <laughs> like, fuck yeah, I want this. My point was that I'd get into these <laughs> rooms and it was a month long room and I'd fucking put posters up and shit. <laughs> I'd like make it look like my room yeah. because I was like, I want to feel cozy. I don't get to yeah. have a room. Do you do that on the ship? Oh God, yeah. Um, some people don't, but I do big time. Like. Most of the bulkheads are all metal, so if you take some magnets with you, you can just magnet stuff to the bulkheads, or if you take a flag, like I've got a piano, it's become a teeth flag, it always comes with me, just get some of those one pound 
hooks from Hamland with sticky backs, put that on it and use that. Yeah, no, I'm a big fan of just taking things that make you feel homely. Nice. I think it's important to uh, learn to be able to live anywhere and make mm. yourself feel at home. Oh yeah, definitely. Would you say that that's one of the things that you learn whilst being out? Yeah, I mean, I was quite good any of any, any for it because of university, travelling around a bit and doing your little bit of touring here and there. But yeah, you learn, because you might only have two suitcases come with you, you learn the bare essentials to make you feel cosy, whether it's like a little tin of photographs or banners or posters or pictures of home or... Yeah, and but, in terms of entertainment, what do you take other than video games? Well, I do a lot of drawing. And luckily, in the days, laptops, so you can watch films, you can play games, you listen yeah. to music, you can write, that's brilliant. I read a lot. Like a Kindle is the best purchase you can make if you're going to see. So, just the last thing yeah. I want to touch on. The myths, and I asked you this before, that are associated with with being out at sea. Yeah. I know we've touched on some, but mm -hmm. are there any more that you can think of? Well, I don't think most sailors turn gay because they haven't seen a woman for six weeks. <laughs> but we're violent. We're not. You can't live with 20 people you barely know and be aggressive and violent towards people. But we're terrible with money. How long's a piece of string? Depends on the person. But we're womanizers. Again, yeah. Some people love going into port and be like, right, we're going to do tonight, lads. But at the same time, others just like, oh, I just want a night off. So again, no more than the average lads going into a city centre on a Friday night. Oh, well, and we're not alcoholics because we couldn't do our job in the middle of the ocean when something goes wrong and there's no one else to help us if we're in that state. <laughs> yeah. What about tattoos? Yeah, there's quite a lot of tattoos at sea. Yeah? Yeah, no, that's fairly true. <laughs> that's cool. I, I had Matt Lodder. I'm not sure if you've listened to the episode. Yes, he did the tattoo, history tattooing thing and he, yeah. I went to it at the Portsmouth Historic Dockyards awesome. and it was really, really good. I loved it. That was, I was listening out on the way to Leeds to have heart. That was a great episode. <laughs> I yeah. loved that episode so much. This is why I wanted to have you on the podcast mm -hmm. because, you know, it's talking to people who are experiencing things that other people can't understand. Yeah. And that's not, doesn't, you don't have to be a doctor <laughs> for that. You have to mm. be in a situation that other people can't understand. But I think that for people to become well-rounded. You need to know what's out there. Exactly. And I think it's something you touched on earlier. It's something we need to talk to people in schools and not just my industry. There's a lot of hidden industries that people don't even know about. It felt at school where it'd give you like 10 jobs on the board, pick one of them. As you get older, you realise, bloody hell, it really diverges a lot bigger than that. Well, dude, thank you so much for chatting. No worries, today. thank you. I've really enjoyed it, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. I really hope you enjoyed listening to that episode of the podcast. I had such a great time talking to Richard. I find it absolutely fascinating learning about a subject that I originally went into the conversation knowing so little about. I hope you all feel the same because I am really excited to share the upcoming episodes with everyone. We've been working really hard to book guests in that are talking about topics I think we all know very little about or at least could definitely do with knowing more about. So if you did enjoy this episode, subscribe, leave us a review, leave us a comment. That keeps us encouraged and really helps us to continue making more episodes. Thank you for listening and catch you next time. Like someone feels lonely, they probably also don't feel at home or comfortable with the general nine to five living anyway. Which I think most of the negatives are very to anyone who's in the street. I think one collective income of people is most of the people who've visited.